Hello, welcome to my study. It's great to have you back with me. Well, uh, I hope you had a good weekend. I hope you're able to tune in for our service at half past 11 on Sunday. Uh, it was great to see different people and people from the wider community and from the wider world as well, which was just amazing. Well, we're looking at Luke chapter 19 today. But before we get on to the chapter itself, I did have one question from chapter 18. And in fact, it was some verses that I didn't really touch on. It's verses 28 and 29. So if you've got your Bibles there, it'd be great to turn them up and look at them with me. So verses 28 and 29 come at the end of the account of Jesus talking to this rich ruler. And Peter says to Jesus, we have left all we had to follow you. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. And the question was, is Jesus here teaching a prosperity gospel? So we follow Jesus and Jesus gives us good things now. Well, it isn't. But it is teaching us that there are benefits in following Jesus. It's a reminder that when we put Jesus first, it's not all about what we give up. Because you remember the, the rich man, Jesus told him to um, sell everything he had and give to the poor. And he went away sad. And sometimes when we think about following Jesus, we can think about it only in terms of what we have to give up. Especially if we're trying to make that decision whether we should follow Jesus. And it's not all about rewards being only in the future, because sometimes we think, well, our reward is in heaven. And of course it is. We have got, as we saw on Sunday, we've got that inheritance in heaven that's kept safe for us by God. But Jesus says there are rewards now as well. The benefits now are also amazing. And one of the great benefits is that we get a new family. It's interesting that Jesus couches it in terms of home and wife, brothers and sisters, parents, children. Because when we become a Christian, we become part of this new family. And we have family members all around the world. One of the things that um, many of us are missing are, are being in direct contact with our church family because we know that these fellow Christians in our local community become so special to us. They encourage us, they build us up. Um, we feel their pain and they feel ours. And there's also that worldwide connection. I was so fortunate two years ago to be at an international meeting in Jerusalem. And there, there were Christians from all around the world. Yet I felt an instant connection with them because we were part of that same family. And it's interesting, I was reflecting, sometimes when I'm at a meeting here uh, in the UK, a secular meeting, not, not a church meeting, um, there's, even though I'm, I share many things with other people around the table, if that shared faith isn't there, there's, there's something missing. Yet these Christians who I'd never met before, from cultures, from situations so different from mine, yet there was there a connection. And that's what happens when we follow Jesus. We're connected with people who also love him, even if their circumstances are very different to ours. And that is a wonderful plus. And of course, we also gain other things from following Jesus. Hope, a future, an identity, knowing that we're precious and loved by God. So, yes, we do have benefits in the here and now when we follow Jesus. Not a big house, not a flash car, not a swimming pool, but this new family, this new hope, this new identity. Now, of course, there are rewards in the future as well, and we'll see that as we study our chapter today. And so let's look at it together. It's chapter 19 of Luke's Gospel. And it does start off with a very famous story, a very famous account, and that is Zacchaeus the tax collector, the, the very little man that we sang about as children in Sunday school, those of us with the privilege of a Christian upbringing. And it is a great account too, because it both points back to the chapter that we've just had 
and forward to the teaching that we've got ahead of us in the rest of this chapter. Now it points back because we've got a contrast with this rich ruler that we've just met, the rich ruler of chapter 18 verses 18 to 30. Now both these characters are rich aren't they? We've got this ruler whose who's love is his wealth and we've got this tax collector who we're told was wealthy, chapter 19 verse 2. And they were both important people. One was a ruler and Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector. Now I'm not sure I'd clocked on that about Zacchaeus before. He's the chief tax collector. So he's really important. And both of these guys have a conversation with Jesus. But that is where the similarity ends. Because the ruler, as we saw, he went away with his money intact, but he was sad. And Zacchaeus, he ends up going away glad, yet much of his wealth has gone. So what's, what's going on? Well, here we've got a work of God. Remember chapter 18, verse 27. The disciples are, are astonished that this rich man uh, isn't saved, that, that rich people find it difficult to get into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Zacchaeus here is the proof of that statement. Because Zacchaeus, his heart is changed. Because it's no accident that these two stories, these two incidents, this rich ruler and Zacchaeus, are separated by the account of Jesus opening the eyes of the blind man. We saw that that was a real incident, but also an illustration of what God needs to do to the eyes of our hearts. It's a work of grace. And actually, Zacchaeus has got something else similar with the, the blind man. Remember, we thought about the blind man sitting by the side of the road, the place where he would be in contact with people as they came, and also the place where he would meet Jesus. And here, Zacchaeus also places himself somewhere where he can meet with Jesus. We're told that he wanted to see him. Verse three, he wanted to see him, but because he was so sure, he couldn't see Jesus over the crowd. So rather than get sad about that or wander away thinking, oh, well, I'll not bother now. Zacchaeus took action. He went up that tree, even though for the chief tax collector to climb up in a tree would have been incredibly undignified, wouldn't it? Yet he took action. He wanted to see Jesus. So he put himself in a place where he could see Jesus. And then when Jesus came and issued this wonderful invitation, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Well, verse six, he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So he's put himself in a place to meet Jesus. And then when Jesus opens an invitation to him, he takes it up. And isn't that a wonderful illustration of how we can come to Jesus? Don't, don't just be a bit interested. If that interest is piqued, then do something about it. Put yourself in a place so you can see Jesus more clearly. Read your Bible. Pray. Ask God to open your blind eyes. Listen to Bible teaching to help you to understand the scriptures and Jesus will make himself real to you. And we see with Zacchaeus that as his heart is changed, so his behaviour changes as well. And that is the way round that things happen in scripture. We don't try and make ourselves better in the hope that God will come and love us and do something for us. We receive Jesus. And he changes our heart and our behaviour follows. And it's wonderful, isn't it? And Jesus, Jesus really, you know, rejoices in it. Verse nine, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And hasn't that been his mission all along? Haven't we seen that as we've travelled through Luke's gospel? That 
Jesus came following the, John's preparation, but still with a message of repentance to, to turn to follow him. And here we see it exemplified in Zacchaeus. So it points back to the chapter that's come, that, that went before, but it also points forward to the rest of the chapter because of the rest of the chapter is all about both salvation and judgment because you can't have salvation if there's nothing to be saved from can you it doesn't make sense the salvation well there's something that you're being saved from and we'll see the the judgment of God in this chapter now our next parable this parable of the ten meaners as it's called in in my bible is a very sobering parable but we've got to read it in the context in which it's written and we're told verse 11 while they were listening to this he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once so here's this misconception they kind of partly got there haven't they that Jesus is to do with the kingdom of God that Jesus brings the kingdom of God but where they'd kind of got things wrong was that they thought Jesus was going to come in and herald this new kingdom right then in human terms. That he was going to go and defeat the Romans and rule from Jerusalem. And of course, Jesus is the king. He is the ruler and he is going to reign from his throne. But, but not then, not at that moment in time. He had a very different purpose. His purpose was to come and die. And so the people there needed to know that there was going to be this delay, but also that they needed to respond to him in the here and now. And so he tells this parable. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So there's there's the delay. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said until I come back. So there's his servants and they're given a job to do while they wait for his return. And the backdrop to that is this rejection. Verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. It says a rejection of the king. And all of this is happening in the delay. Now, in spite of all of that, um, some of these servants, or one of these servants in particular, um, does really well, doesn't he? He he takes the, the 10 minas he's been given and he puts that money to work so that it produces 10 more. And other servants too do really well. But there's one servant who doesn't. The one servant who takes the, the mina he's given and um, just hides it in a piece of of cloth and we see that the ones who who put the money to work get rewarded and the one who who hides it gets it taken away and then we also see at the very end of the parable what happens to those who rejected the king and it's uh, it's quite hard isn't it verse 27 but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them bring them here and kill them in front of me so what's going on? Well, there are messages for us there about what we are doing with this delay in Jesus' return. Remember, Jesus' delay in coming back is so that as many people as possible can come to him. So it's a gracious delay. It's a gracious delay. But he is coming back. What are we doing in the meantime? Are we taking the gifts that God has given us, the gift of faith, if we've been given that gift, we know Jesus we have what are we doing with it what are we doing with the the means we've got of sharing the good news what are we doing with the gifts that God has given us what are we doing with the physical wealth that God has given us if he's given it to us are we using it for God are we using it to grow his kingdom are we using it to to invite people to get to know him what are we doing with what we've got and there are rewards for when we do humbly and faithfully 
follow God. And we mustn't be squeamish about that. I think sometimes we're a bit squeamish about thinking that, that God might give us something back because we know that our salvation doesn't rest on what we've done, but on what Jesus has done. But nevertheless, Jesus promises reward. This is what J.C. Ryle says. The people of God receive little apparent recompense in this present time. Their names are often cast out as evil. They enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. Their good things are not in this world. The gain of godliness does not consist in earthly rewards, but in inward peace and hope and joy in believing. But they shall have an abundant recompense one day. They shall receive wages far exceeding anything they have done for Christ. They shall find to their amazement that for everything they have done and borne for their master, their master will pay them a hundredfold. Because did you notice in that parable that the rewards did far outweigh what those people had done? Ten cities in reward for just looking after this amount of money. Ten cities. And isn't that just a picture of the grace, the grace and the mercy of God. But there's also a danger in this parable, isn't there? Because you've got this one servant who who appears to be a servant, but he does nothing with what his master has given him. And you do start to question, does he know the master at all? Because verse 21, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Well, is that what we've seen of, of this of this man? This man who's just given 10 cities? Is this, is this what he's really like? I think that this servant is a bit like the elder son in the parable, parable of the prodigal son that we looked at a few days ago. Because he berated his father for not giving him anything. And yet his father had given him everything. So this servant doesn't really know his master, does he? And so that privilege of calling himself a servant is going to be taken away. You know, it's a very similar message to chapter 12, verse 48 that we looked at uh, a little while ago. You might want to flick back to it. But we see that there, there is this judgment if we say we follow Jesus, but actually don't really know him. And then there is a judgment for those who permanently reject the king. We mustn't wipe that out of our understanding because it is here loud and clear in Jesus's teaching. There's also, there's also a wonderful grace in that too, or a, a righting of wrongs. You know, as we, as we think about what's going to happen shortly to Jesus in the gospel, as we know that his his trial and his execution are, are about to come. We think of those people who put him through that unjust trial. We, our hearts cry out for justice, don't they? Just as they cry out for justice when we see things happening in our own society or around the world where, where the weak and the powerless are downtrodden. And we think, is anybody going to call these people to account who are doing these terrible things? Well, Jesus says, yes, there is a calling to account. And this is what J.C. Ryle says. He says, Christ foretells in this parable that there will be a reckoning day. And this is the bit I really liked. Annas and Caiaphas and their companions will yet be brought before Jesus of Nazareth and punished. So there is wonderful hope in that, that God isn't just turning a blind eye to the things that go on, that there is going to be a call into account. And of course, the challenge is for us, not so much to look at what happens to other people, but to think, where, where is my heart? Am I rejecting Jesus? Am I following him with a glad heart? Am I using what he's given me for his glory? And we see this kind of contrast between uh, faith and rejection as we move on to the next part of Luke chapter 19. And of course, this is a very famous part of the Gospels. It's what we celebrate every Palm Sunday, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. Oh, it was a shame we weren't able to take our donkeys through the streets of Roost this year as we remembered that incident. 
but here he comes on the donkey. It's a, it's a great visual account. But the bit I want to draw our attention to this morning is there in verse 37. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. So you've got the disciples there praising Jesus. And it's a large crowd. So this isn't just the, the 12. This is all of that wider pool of disciples praising Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. And they're singing some words of a psalm. Now we're going to see in this chapter how important it is to look at the quotations from the Old Testament when they're used in the New because there's so much we can learn from them. So here they are singing the words of Psalm 118 verse 26. Now if you turn to that psalm in your Bible you'll find that it is a psalm of praise and victory. But as you read that psalm, you will notice that verse 26 isn't the only verse that's quoted in Luke's Gospel. In fact, in the very next chapter, we'll see verse 22 quoted in Luke 20, verse 17. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And so we see even with this note of praise, that rejection is coming. And of course, we see that in the next verse in chapter 19, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, there's an attempt there to shut out the truth. Here's the disciples praising God, recognising who Jesus is. And that truth is attempted to be shut by those who've rejected him. And that still happens today. Often those who want to speak the truth about Jesus are shut down and locked out. That message, hidden. But it won't be hidden always. Jesus says that one day those things which are said in the dark will be said out in the public arena. Jesus can't be shut down or locked out forever. But nevertheless, even as we think about these big topics of judgment, we see that Jesus doesn't treat them lightly and he doesn't treat them in a triumphant way either. Because what's the next thing he does? Look down at verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept. And this is a heartfelt response of Jesus. He's weeping not because his feelings are being hurt, because he's being rejected. He's weeping because he knows what the future is going to hold for those who reject him. And it breaks his heart. He longs for everyone to come to him. Remember earlier on in Luke's Gospel where we saw him looking over the people and wanting to gather them up like a hen gathers her chicks. Jesus longs for everyone to come to him. But we've also seen that the unforgivable sin, the only unforgivable sin, is not coming to Jesus to receive that forgiveness. And he knew that for some of those people that would be the, the future for them. And in fact that there would be um, an acted out judgment in their near future. Because verses 43 and 44, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. And Jesus knew that in just a few years time, Jerusalem would be destroyed, AD 70. And he, he knew that that would be a cause of great physical pain and great spiritual pain too. And I have to say, when I was last in Jerusalem two years ago, I went back to where the temple stood and you can see those stones on the ground. And we'll see that again because the disciples um, raise this conversation with Jesus as they look at the temple. But as I saw them on the ground, it made me see the stark reality 
of what happened and feel just a tiny bit of the pain that Jesus felt as he knew what would happen. And its cause is given at the end of verse 44. Because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. So there's, there's that spiritual explanation of that historical event, the destruction of Jerusalem. And it is also a picture of the greater judgment to come. And we'll see more about that in chapter 21. Because it's going to happen doesn't give Jesus any joy. Jesus weeps. And then we see Jesus going in to the temple. We also find as well as weeping, Jesus gets very cross. We don't really get a sense of the full crossness of Jesus about things in Luke's gospel here. We have to look at the other gospels to, to get that. We just get two very simple verses. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And we know from the fuller accounts here that, that Jesus then casts out um, those people who are buying and selling. In fact, in John's gospel, he chases them out with a whip made of cords. You know, <laughs> Jesus, not gentle Jesus, meek and mild there, is it? He's got his whip of cords and he's chasing them out. Well, why? What's made him so cross? Well, to get the full understanding, we need to look up those quotations in the Bible. We need to see what was going on at the time. So the first quotation, my house will be a house of prayer, comes from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. And if we look at that whole chapter, then we see that this is a prophecy about all nations coming to God. All nations, not just the historic people of God. And it's also about the bringing in of those who are cast out. This is a whole bit about the, the eunuchs coming in. So here's God welcoming all nations. Here's God having a place for them. And that's contrasted in, in that chapter of Isaiah with the blind watchmen and the bad shepherds of Israel. So why would Jesus pick that quote? Well, these buyers and sellers in the temple, they were there taking up the space where the Gentiles would come into the temple. They were in the outer courtyards, the place for the Gentiles. So they were filling the physical space where those other people could be. And they were also taking up the spiritual space, weren't they? They were detracting from, from God and from the salvation that he was offering. And that made Jesus so cross and so sad. And the other quote, you've made it a den of robbers, is from Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11. And that's also a chapter about judgment because God's people were oppressing others. And the result of that is that God says the temple and the lands will be taken away. And so suddenly we understand so much more of what was going on there. We see Jesus there again, a sort of a, a prophetic act, cleansing the temple, judging what's going on, symbolic of that greater judgment that's going to come. And verse, verse uh, 47 does not give any hope at the end of the chapter. Every day he was teaching at the temple. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. They've not been listening, have they? They've not been watching these acts. They've not understood. The people still are on Jesus' side, but that will change, won't it? And so as we finish this chapter, it makes us ask the question of ourselves, does it? Where am I? Where am I in all of this? Am I still rejecting Jesus? Am I listening in, but not really hearing? Well, if that's you, then ask Jesus to open your eyes because what's impossible for man is possible with God. If he could open the eyes of this chief tax collector, then he can open yours too. As you place yourself in those opportunities to get to know Jesus. Are you somebody who is following him? 
Well, that's brilliant. Enjoy those those riches that God has given you, both in the here and now and in the future. But don't just sit there. You've got a job to do as well in this delay time, in this time before Jesus returns in judgment. Use those gifts wisely for God. He delights in it. And the rewards will be there, both just in the doing of it. And that's been my experience. But also Jesus promises things in the future too. So encouragement, but also hard words. And we'll see the pace pick up now because we are not far away from Jesus's arrest and crucifixion. Well, let's pray, shall we? I think we need to pray, don't we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that though people rejected him, he didn't stop loving them. And we thank you that that you love every single person that you have made, even those whose hearts are so hard that they reject you every day. And we thank you that you can change even those hard hearts and turn them to you. And so I pray, dear Father, for a great work of your Holy Spirit. Come and soften those hard hearts here in in our village, here in, in this world that you have made. And we pray that you would help those of us who already have the privilege of knowing you to work for you, not to be distracted, not to be just content. Forgive us when we've had a false view of you. Oh, correct us as we read your word and help us to come with full and loving hearts, hearts full of service for you. And as we read these passages about judgment, help us not to be afraid. Help us to remember that that judge, Jesus, is also the one who bore the punishment of judgment in his own body. And help us to take great comfort from that. And so come, continue to be our teacher. Help us to grow in you day by day, that our lives might be to your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you'll join us tomorrow, God willing, as we look at chapter 20 of Luke's Gospel. Bye for now.